Coming off their bye week, the Dallas Cowboys managed to get back on track thanks to a 37-18 victory over the New York Giants. Now, as much as I would love to praise the team for getting another win in the division, moving to 4-0 in the division overall, I can't help but be frustrated by the continued lack of preparation, it feels like. Like, I don't have a problem with the game plan, and so I'm not killing the coaches for this, but I can't help but think that there is a problem in the execution department and that the team half the time when they're walking out there for the game through the tunnel, they just kind of look asleep on their feet and slow starts have been pretty much the bane of the Cowboys season with the exception being the last game before the bye when they beat the Philadelphia Eagles thanks to two very quick turnovers in the first few minutes of the game deep in Eagles territory that allowed the narrative to kind of change there. But for the most part, Dallas has started slow all year long. And unlike the first matchup with the Giants, the offense didn't eventually just click into a gear where it was just suddenly long touchdown drive, long touchdown drive, long touchdown drive, long five straight scoring touchdowns. Or I think it was four touchdowns and a field goal. And then the next week with the Redskins, it was five touchdowns. I might have those two flipped, but that that's neither here nor there. The point is... The offense has not looked quite the same in recent weeks. And I don't know that it's so much that Kellen Moore's tendencies have been figured out. Obviously, that's going to contribute to it a little bit. But Dallas just hasn't looked like the monster offensively that we saw through the first three weeks of the season. And I still think they're not completely using some of those different elements they used before, such as the pre-snap motion, at least to the extent. They're not using play action as much as we would like either. But you know what? It's okay not ideal, but it's okay in a game like this because you should beat New York anyway. New York is not, they're division rivals, sure, but they are not as good as the Dallas Cowboys. They have Saquon Barkley, who wreaked havoc last time around. Uh, had at one point, I think, 11 carries for 128 yards in the season opener against Dallas. And other than that, you got a rookie in Daniel Jones, who was not playing except for like the last drive for the Giants of that week one matchup. So this was very much a game Dallas should have dominated, and they did anything but for the majority of this game. Dallas falls behind again 12-3 to in this game. First play of the game, Dak Prescott makes a very weird, uh, very weird play. Throws it right to Antoine Bethea. Interception. First of all, even before that happens, on the opening kickoff, you have Pollard make a crucial mistake, uh, catch the ball and step out of bounds basically at the 12-yard line, the Dallas 12-yard line. Very next play, Dak Prescott throws a pick. Defense, though, buckles. Or, excuse me, defense does not buckle. They hold the Giants to a chip shot field goal, and instead Dallas trails only 3 to nothing. So Dallas very early on avoids disaster. The red zone defense for the Cowboys was fantastic in this game. They give up one touchdown on the day. So I don't have any real complaints there. But the Giants did move the ball. They just couldn't ever cap it off. In the red zone, they could not get the job done. And so that still leaves me with a little bit of concern there. But there was a lot, there was a lot in this game, obviously, to focus on. Dallas answers with a field goal. The Giants then get a touchdown, move it to 9-7 because Rosas misses an extra point, clanks it off the upright, and then the Giants add another field goal. So it's 12-3, and we're all sitting here like, holy S, we're just a few minutes away from halftime, and we're losing by two scores to the New York Giants right now. Then you get the weird stuff happening. On that last Giants drive that ends in the field goal, Dallas catches a break. I guess you have the kind of memeable moment of the night where you have a stray cat that apparently, among many others, lives under the stadium. The cats come out after the game and are fed by the people in New York, some of the fans. But for whatever reason, a black cat runs out onto the field. In fact, it was on the field during one of the plays. Thankfully, it never got further than midfield because the play was all happening on the on the far end of the field. But... The cat runs out on the field, and he's just completely overwhelmed by everything he's seeing. And as a result, uh, play kind of stops down for a moment, and it takes probably two or three minutes to get things back in order. The cat's sprinting around, and it runs into the end zone, and you get a great call on the radio 
uh, broadcast there, and it, it's it's entertaining enough, but it, it's kind of weird too because it just completely stops everything down. Say what you want. You could say the black cat was going to be a jinx for the Cowboys or whatever. It apparently worked the opposite way because from that point on, Dallas outscored New York by a score of 34 to 6. Now, I mentioned the field goal that put them up 12 3. That happened after the cat. Dallas gets the ball, drives down the field, and you have just a giant killing play as he tends to do. You see right there, excuse me, right there at the bottom of the list here. Blake Jarwin, the giant killer, Mr. Seek and Destroy for New York or against New York. One catch on the game, but he goes 42 yards for the touchdown. He now has, let me see, five career touchdowns against the Giants. He has one other touchdown in his career against all other teams. So his stats against the Giants, he looks like a pro bowler. You put him against anybody else, and he's a guy that is barely out there some games. So... I don't know what to make of that. He had three, obviously, in the Week 17 matchup last year, the finale for the regular season. Uh, had one in the opener this year and one here. So Blake Jarwin turns things around. Of course, on that play, you have Janoris Jenkins make a very clear business decision around the 10-yard line, barely puts out an arm to even you know, bounce off of Jarwin, doesn't make any effort to actually put his head down and tackle him. So Jar- Jarwin rumbles into the end zone, and just like that, it's 12-10 to 10 Dallas. Well, then New York makes a very curious decision again. They decide, hey, we're going to press our luck. We're going to try and push the ball down the field. Daniel Jones, he's got ability for sure, but he will will turn the ball over. And not just interceptions, he will cough it up on fumbles, which we would see later as well. But he forces a pass down about midfield, and it's such a staring down the receiver thing that the Cowboys get a rare interception on the season. You have Xavier Woods come over, intercept it, and return it back to the New York 40. That that was that felt like the turning point of the game for Dallas because the Jarwin touchdown breathed some life into them, but New York was going to get the ball in the second half. So if they could get any points before halftime, even if it was just another field goal and then the ball right back, they had a chance to bury Dallas there. Instead, Dallas gets the ball back at New York 40, about 22 seconds left. Dallas gets a little bit of, gains a little bit of yardage, and they're able to churn out a 52-yarder, I want to say, from Brett Maher. Makes it 13-10 Dallas at half. Now, Maher had already missed a 40 or 54-yarder earlier in the half, but he gets this one to go. So Dallas actually takes a one-point lead into the half in a game that they weren't outplayed. They were outgaining New York, and the run defense was phenomenal. Big shout out to uh, Sean Lee. Had a fantastic game. He looked kind of vintage Sean Lee there, seek and destroy, reading things at the line of scrimmage and blowing them up before they could really develop. And uh, you also had a big game out of Jalen Smith as well. But Dallas kept Saquon Barkley firmly in check. On the game, Barkley had 14 carries for just 28 yards. That's two yards in average. Now, to give you some, you know, I mean, yes, he had the 65-yard screen pass in the fourth quarter, the last time the Giants really had a chance to really threaten in that regard. But one play, he broke free. Every Everything else, he was kept firmly in check. And I'll say this, you know, I, I, I don't think there's much question that Saquon Barkley is more explosive and uh, breaks more tackles than Ezekiel Elliott. But Zeke is just, at this point, he's not the home run threat, but he's very steady for the most part. Zeke in his career has only been held under 50 yards three times to date, and Zeke's had 40-something games to his ledger at this point. Saquon Barkley, in about 22 games to date, has been held under 50 yards nine times. So I get it. There's a difference in the offensive line that they've had to work with and where those teams were in terms of respective rebuilds. But the point still stands. Saquon Barkley, for all of his ability has not been as consistent as Zeke in that regard. And Zeke puts up 137 or 139 yards, six yards a carry here in this game. This was a continuation for Zeke. The Philadelphia game before the, the bye week was huge for him, the best game he put together all year. And I think this was another very quality game for him as well. This looks like the guy that they paid. The first five, six weeks of the season, I didn't see that guy, and it was frustrating as hell. Now he looks like he's finally in a rhythm and that he's able to help the Dallas dominate this game because that's how Dallas got things going offensively again they were putting a lot on the pass 
And it was working. They were moving the ball, but they couldn't get over that hump. They kind of calmed things down a little bit with a run game, let Zeke go to work. Zeke, again, six yards of carry. He ate the Giants' front up alive. And that opened up some other things for him, not just play action, but other other options as well for them in terms of misdirection and things like that they could run. So Dallas gets the ball back. Uh, you, you have continued trading off of field goals. It, it's still frustrating. Dallas then moves up at that point to 16 to 12 then it's 16 15 then dallas gets do they get another field goal no they get a touchdown at that point you have the michael gallup front flip which the broadcast for espn was pretty garbage i thought uh i just don't think that at times they would repeat things that the other guy said like someone would say something the other guy would sit quietly wait for him to say something and then tell the exact same story and it's like were you not even listening to your partner and if they weren't doing that, they were just constantly assaulting you with these stupid ass 3D rendering graphics. Uh, you know, like how they're talking about Dak Prescott before the game, how, oh, and the Giants, he is, the last five games, he has just been an unprecedented level of confidence. What does that mean? Do you mean unprecedented for Dak? That seems subjective and like you're making an assumption in that regard. And then what happens? The very first play of the game, as I said, Dak throws that pick and it's like, oh, unprecedented. Yes. So it it was not a good broadcast, but and I brought up the broadcast because on that Gallup play, Dak makes a beautiful throw, right? Just lays it just over the finger outstretched fingertips of the Giants defender there. Michael Gallup comes back, kind of has to get it low. It's catching it right around waist level, but he's kind of bent down to get it. Then stays on his feet, flips over the Giants cornerback and into the end zone phenomenal play but on the call you have burger mcfarland going oh yeah that's all dak right there and it's like he's saying this as Gallup is tightrope walking the sideline and then hurtling and somersaulting over the giants defender into the end zone like uh can we at least say that's 50 <laughs> 50 like dak makes a great throw but Gallup has to come back for it which is the route bend down, like really get down and catch it, keep his balance, avoid the contact, and jump over a man to get into the end zone. And you're like, that's all Dak right there. Yeah, 50-50. Let's get that. Uh, even then, the Giants, though, answer back immediately. That's when you have the 65-yard Saquon Barkley screen pass. And that had a chance to go all the way. And if it does, this is a very different game. But instead, Dallas is able to force him out inside the five. And... With how good the Cowboys' defensive front had been playing and the defense as a whole, you pretty much knew then and there they weren't going to get into the end zone. And Dallas, sure enough, holds firm, holds the Giants to another field goal. Instead, then the lead at that point is 23 to, I guess, 19 at that point. Uh, 18, excuse me, 23-18. That was the Giants' last score there. Uh, There's a controversial call the Giants are upset about. Uh, in which on third down, I think it's third and five, uh, it looks like Cheeto goes through the back of Evan Ingram a little bit, just a second before the ball gets there. In in defense, it's pass interference. It is. But because of how that challenge rule has worked this year in the NFL, I think it's something like 54 attempts have been made on calling pass interference, and only five have been overturned by challenge. So it's like a 15% you know rate and when the broadcast team is even saying yeah that's just an emotional challenge it's kind of like yeah don't don't get your hopes up buddy like it's not going to happen here so as a result as a result of that the giants lose that timeout have to settle for that field goal and then sure enough on the next drive uh the rookie baker gets caught getting handsy with amari cooper some people said it's a little iffy he he grabs him earlier in the route so you could say hey instead of it being I think it was like a 15-yard penalty in yardage in terms of where the contact was called. It could have been a five-yard for just defensive holding. Regardless, it was correct to throw a flag, but it did add on an extra 10 yards that seemed unnecessary. And then a few moments later, you have the Amari Cooper play, 45 yards and busted coverage, and that's pretty much the backbreaker in this game. Like uh, Baker busts on the coverage. He thinks it's a zone 
zone defense in that case. It's actually man, so he has zero help. Just turns over Amari Cooper, streaking down the middle of the field. Cooper on pretty much one foot, catches it, goes 45 yards to the house, and pretty much buries this game at this point. We're talking 30 to 12. Yeah, there was other chippiness too. There was all kinds of stuff where Daniel Jones at one point scrambles to the sideline on third down before he steps out of bounds. He gets kind of checked by Xavier Woods. He wipes out hard into an equipment guy there holding one of those uh, you know, big bubble microphones. And I get that it looks bad, but it's a legal hit. The referee didn't even argue that it was an illegal hit. So no issue there at all. But the instigator of the night who amazingly got called for literally nothing, Will Hernandez, runs over, gets in the face of... And I get it, right? It's your. It's not just a young quarterback. It's not just your teammate. It, it's your quarterback in general. So you get he gets popped and kind of pumps like that. Even though the other guy was in his right to do it, you're going to take up for him. So Will Hernandez comes over, gets in Xavier Woods' face. Woods and him kind of you know, tussle a little bit, nothing major. But Woods is called for taunting, a 15-yard penalty. And you're like, you're watching the replay and you're like, where does he taunt? The other guy runs up on him and shoves him. He might, I'm sure he says something back or pushes back, but just the call of taunting was a weird choice there. But it was like, okay, whatever, bad, bad penalty. Giants are moving. Let's just see what comes of it. Uh, then you have moments later as well. Saquon Barkley gets down, uh, gets down as well. And at that point, I think it was New York's last drive deep into Dallas territory. Uh, Barkley gets tackled. He stands up. He's holding the ball. Jalen Smith right there kind of swats at the ball. And, oh, look what happens again. You have another tussle with Will Hernandez. That one wasn't called. And that, I think, was actually Jalen trying to bait Hernandez into finally getting called. Even though he still took the bait, he didn't get called. Uh, you had a scramble on one of those Giants field goals, that last one that they had. Just an ugly, ugly game. You had, like, four skirmishes in the second half of this game, and Will Hernandez was pretty much at the center point of all of it. Now, the first one of it, the the one I described earlier with Daniel Jones, that happened late in the third quarter. That wasn't after the Amari Cooper touchdown. That was just me pivoting to other notes of the game. But it, it was just a madhouse. I mean, you had so many penalties. You had uh, Lillard March pulling uh, the guy off the pile. That one to me is really subjective because – while I understand the intentions, like, oh, you just don't want a guy getting thrown around and getting injured or whatever, he pulls him off the pile, but he's pretty much setting him back on his feet, and he's not even, like, he's not even jawing with the guy or shoving at the guy. He's just like, hey, yo, you're laying on top of my dude. The 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 ref's already blown the whistle. Get up. And then the official still flags him for 15 yards. So you had rinky-dink stuff like that, but it, it was a really badly officiated game. Bad calls on both sides. I, I don't know how Will Hernandez. Will Hernandez could have basically stabbed a man on the field and the Cowboys would have been flagged for it somehow. That's kind of how the game was going in that regard. It was getting chippy because the Giants were about to lose their, what was it, like fifth straight at that point? It would have been their fifth straight loss. They were about to move to 2-7 and seven on the season and they were getting punked. They could not beat Dallas in that regard. And so they're frustrated. This is six straight losses to the Cowboys for the Giants overall. That is the longest uh, the longest stretch. It ties the longest stretch either team has put together consecutive wins in the series, which is pretty incredible thinking back to the history of the two franchises, especially in the 70s when the Giants were pretty trash. But it is what it is. Um, very, very gritty game. Cowboys played with their food, played with their food, played with their food, and didn't really separate themselves until the late third quarter and really into the fourth quarter. And yes, you get the the strip sack there as well from Dorrance Armstrong gets a strip sack at the end on Daniel Jones. Uh, you have Jordan Lewis pick it up, run it back for a touchdown. Just icing on the cake. Dallas gets a 37-18 to 18 win. Uh, Michael Bennett in his debut had a pretty solid appearance there. I think he had, I don't have the numbers exactly in front of me, but he had... A pretty solid showing overall. I think he had, let's see, him, Lawrence, and Quinn combined for nine tackles, two and a half sacks, five quarterback hits, and two tackles for loss. That's pretty quality there. Bennett had three tackles, a quarterback sack, and three hits, two tackles for loss. So Bennett, Bennett did a lot of work on that. This was a good game from D-Law. This was a good game from Bennett. Uh, 
Quinn made some impact as well. You know, not just him ripping off Hernandez's helmet, finally getting sick of all his antics, but really impressive showing for Martell, or not Martell, excuse me, his brother, former Cowboy Martellus Bennett, for Michael Bennett in his Cowboys debut. I think he's going to add a lot to this team. That was my article I wrote for Clutch Points. Uh, it hasn't been published yet. I've submitted it to him. It's being edited, so hopefully it drops either today or tomorrow. But basically saying why Michael Bennett, even though he's only a rental for the rest of this season, why he's going to be a major impact player for the Cowboys, a monster, if you will, for this defensive front. So there's a lot to look forward to there. Cowboys, though, as a team, yes, they move to 5-3 and three now on the season. Halfway point, and uh, they, they're going to have a tough schedule coming ahead, right? You got the Vikings, you got the Patriots, you got a lot coming up that you better damn well be prepared for. And if this was a, a measuring stick of how much they've improved, you know, if the, if the Philadelphia game was an aberration or if it was the start of a new trend, I would say it looks more like an aberration to me. This was a team Dallas let hang around way too long. They don't look like they have that killer instinct right now. They still got eight games to put it together, but right now I don't see it, and I am concerned that this is a team that is far too talented, playing far too like far too low compared to what their potential is, what heights they can reach. They're they're settling for a middle of the road uh you know, realization of that. So that's going to do it for my time. Thank you for watching. Until next time, guys, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Salute.